All right, welcome everyone. I have a couple of generalized announcements, uh, practical of a practical nature, uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker. Um, first of all, as you see from your handouts, we're going to have about a 45-minute conversation um, with a time for question and answer afterwards. Um, Next in the series, we're having our very own Alice Fogel, who also happens to be the Poet Laureate of New Hampshire for Poetry Month here on April 2nd. And her title is very long, and I forget it all the time. Um, but it, it's a whole string of things that may or may not be related to poetry. So uh, the title is actually on the posters outside. Take a look at it as you go out. Um, and come back on April 2nd for Alice Fogel. Having said all that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jamie Sheffield, mystery author, special education professional, and author of the Tyler Cunningham series of Adirondack Mysteries. Jamie's interest in neurodiversity is of long standing, and his love for the Adirondacks manifest in his work. Without further ado, I yield the stage. Please welcome Jamie Sheffield. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm mostly going to hide behind the podium because that's how I'll be a little more comfortable. But I'll step out from time to time. Thank you so much for having me here. Tonight, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk, and hopefully some of you will talk back at me. <laughs> about uh, neurodiverse characters in fiction. Hopefully, perspectives beyond the vanilla. Um, let me see what we got here. A brief idea of what we're going to talk about. I did a handout, sort of. But we will talk about these issues, these things, during my uh, time up here that you're kindly sharing with me. Why I choose to write about neurodiversity. A short reading from my first book, Here Be Monsters, Neurodiverse Characters in Fiction, some examples and hopefully a discussion. A little bit about the writing process, and then a slightly deeper dive into my writing process, how I wrote Tyler Cunningham and why. And then ending up with guiding principles from some other writers, and then we'll go on and do a discussion with questions from any of you that have them. At the same time, I know that if you have a burning question, it can take up all of your brain space and make it hard to listen to other stuff or make it tougher to concentrate. So if you have a question that you worry won't hold till the end or you really want to get out, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you and answer, or hopefully answer it. So. I was born in New York City and grew up there a lot of my life. We balanced that with spending summers, because my parents were teachers mostly, up in the Adirondacks, which for those of you who don't know, it is a huge park in northern New York State, about six million acres, most of it pretty wilderness. and. Um, during that entire time, until today included, I grew up in books, literally and figuratively. I spent my childhood, a lot of times like this, hiding in books, reading them, and learning most of what I know about the world and the way people interact from books. I read mostly mysteries, and I think that is an answer to the mystery of why I write the stuff I do. I enjoy mystery books, mystery novels, and crime, and crime novels. So those are the ones I mostly write. I branched out recently, and I'm writing a fantasy novel, and I'm also writing a collection of shorts. But mostly I write mystery fiction because that's what I love to read. I, when, we, my, when my wife and I moved to Lake Placid in the Adirondacks about 20 years ago, I started working as a special education teacher in the Lake Placid School District, which some of you it may ring a bell. Lake Placid 
was the host two Winter Olympic Games in 32 and 80. And it's also an island of a town in the middle of an ocean of trees and lakes and wilderness. And it was most while I was there in the Adirondacks that I started thinking about seriously writing a novel. I wanted to write my whole life. I remember borrowing my mom's typewriter when I was eight years old and filling pages with mess of starts of books that I wanted to write. And of course, they didn't get very far. And I tried to write books as an adult with quite similar results. Um, at almost any age, your life fills up with all sorts of stuff. You have to find something that will help you pay the electricity bill. You have to make and clean up meals. You have to take care of young children sometimes. And all of those things can and should, because they're important, get in the way of writing a novel. And so it took me years and years to be able to write a novel. And the way that I figured it out, finally, was in the summer of 2012, I heard from a friend of mine about a program called the National Novel Writing Month, mm -hmm. NaNoWriMo. Some of you might have heard of it. I always talk about it because I love it. It is a program and an organization that helps writers or aspiring writers get out the first draft of a novel. And the idea is that you take a month, and I cleared off a summer month, because I was teaching at the time, so summer months were easier to clear, and you determine and agree to write every day of that month. And at the end of it, hopefully, you have a first draft of a novel. And I did. I spent, I think it was June, might have been July of 2012, writing every day. And at the end of it, I had about a little less than 80,000 words written in the first draft of my novel. And the first draft of it was horrible, <laughs> as every first draft or every first draft I've ever heard of is. It's possible there are writers who can write it the first time, but I don't know if I believe in them. But the writing process, as I'm sure those of you who are in classes, have learned from your teachers is about revision even more than it is about writing. And that's true with novels and it's true with everything we do in the classroom as well. And by the end of the revision process, I had a novel that I felt pretty proud of. And that was Here Be Monsters, which is this first one here. And I went on in subsequent years to write three more novels, Caretakers, Between the Carries, and Thunderstruck. And then that one at the end, The Weaving, is a collection of novellas, which is something between a short story and a novel that I wrote about some of the characters in the books that I liked and wanted to tell people more about. So the question of why neurodiversity, why have a protagonist, my main character, my detective in these books, Tyler Cunningham, is neurodiverse. He thinks different. I am always reminded of Apple computers ran an ad campaign a million years ago now. Think different. And it showed brilliant different thinkers, including Muhammad Ali and Pablo Picasso and uh, Steve Jobs and some other, lots of other people. <laughs> artists, athletes, writers of all sorts, people who think different. And I love the idea of that campaign celebrating people who think and live outside of the box. And it occurred to me that that's what I wanted for my detective, for a lot of reasons. I, I had been working in Lake Placid with people who I considered and still consider to be the most interesting people on earth. And besides that, and besides wanting to have these interesting people manifest in my books, I wanted to have 
a character who was different. I love reading mysteries, and I love hard-boiled detectives. I love the streetwise cop who knows his way around the seamy underbelly of San Francisco or whatever. But I wanted to write about the Adirondacks, and there's no space for that kind of cop or that kind of detective there, I thought. So I wanted what I think of, and I'm sure it's not my own invention, a soft-boiled detective. I wanted a, a detective who was smart, was intelligent in his way, but really didn't get the rules of the way criminal society worked, as most of us don't understand how criminal society works. And what this allowed me to do was to make a character who approaches the mysteries that he tries to solve in hopefully interesting and different ways, but then at the end of the story, or in a lot of cases the middle of the story, because he doesn't understand either the criminals or, in lots of cases, even his friends in Saranac Lake entirely, and the way that they act and react to the way that he acts and reacts, he tends to screw up some facet of the mystery that he's solving. He judges something wrong. He doesn't take something into account. And that's a mistake everybody makes. I make that 10 times a day. But in this case, when you're playing for high stakes, when he's solving life or death mysteries, it has bigger consequences. And it was my thinking at the very beginning of this process that that would make for a fun writing process and a fun reading process. Because I think we've all read enough hard-boiled detectives, I wanted to bring somebody new. So I guess without further ado, I will give a short reading from Here Be Monsters. My throat's a little dry, so I apologize that I keep stopping for water. Beginnings. <clears throat> there was a gentle glow coming on in the sky to my right as I drove north through the cold and empty beauty of the Adirondack Park. I would, have uh, I would have pointed the impending dawn out to the girl in the back of my element if she wasn't unconscious and bleeding on the easy-to-clean floor. I crossed the northern border of the park at the t same time that the sun crept over the white pines on the side of the road. I don't know if that first ray of morning caught her eye, but my passenger groaned, cleared her throat a bit to try and speak, then clacked her teeth hard together again to hold back whatever she was starting to say. I consulted the map in my head, determined that I wouldn't make it to the house before she started acting up, thought about Murphy's Law and the prevalence of state troopers on backcountry roads for only a moment, and then pulled over to deal with Sadie Hot. Sadie Hotstetler. Sadie, my name is Tyler Cunningham. I'm a friend of your father, Jacob, and I'm taking you home, unless you prefer to go to a hospital. I spoke in the same low tone I use with the skittish dogs I walk at the shelter. I'd talked with Dorothy about this very moment, what I should say if I did manage to find Sadie, and how I should say it. Dorothy runs the animal shelter in Saranac Lake. And if I had friends, she would be one of them. Based on a lifetime of reading everything within reach on every subject that caught my eye, my opening statement to Sadie should have been reassuring. It should have started to build some trust between us. It didn't. I'd pulled over and opened the, back, the door to the back of the car so when she hit me with her shoe, we didn't crash. But that was the only good news. She raked for my eyes with significant talons that I hadn't noticed when loading her into the car at a little before 5 a.m. that morning. I grabbed her in a bear hug to try and still her. It didn't work. When she started trying to butt me with the back of her head, I pushed her away from me. Stop it, I yelled, in a much less sympathetic tone than Dorothy might have used in the same situation. But my ear hurt from the shoe and my cheek stung from her nails. I'm not going to hurt you. We're only about 10 miles from your home. Your family likely already has breakfast on the table, 
and that's where I'll take you if you will stop hitting and screaming. We were actually closer to 9.2 road miles from Sadie's home, but I found that people without maps and brains like mine don't want or need that level of exactitude. Who the fuck are you? What's going on? And why on earth would you think that I want to go to my father's house? She asked in a tone that I believe signaled anger and fear and frustration, but not imminent violence. My name is Tyler Cunningham, owner and operator of Smart Pig Kneadery. I'm bringing you back home at the request of Jacob, Jacob Hostetler, your father. I'm not at all certain that you want to go home, but I'm very nearly certain that it's a better option than the place you were until a couple hours ago. Again, 108 minutes is more precise than people generally look for in conversations. Your dad, father, asked for my help when he heard from a friend of yours, Hannah, that you had gotten in some trouble and subsequently disappeared while on your Amish version of Walkabout, Rum Springer. This next bit wasn't true, but it was close enough for a girl that had my right ear ringing and blood running down my face into the collar of a reasonably new shirt. I owed him a favor and he asked, finding you in my world is the sort of thing I'm better at than he would be or he would have done it himself. How did you find me, she asked, now with some interest and a hint of trust in her voice, or at least no open hostility. The same way I do everything else. I read and I research and I ask questions. I throw stones in the water, watch the ripples, and adjust my aim until something happens. I could tell that my answer didn't satisfy her, but also that she wasn't going to ask again, which worked just fine for me. What are you going to tell my father about how and where you found me? She asked, noticing for the first time, perhaps, that she had on a too big man shirt, mine, from the get home bag I keep in the car, and a pair of panties that wouldn't be out of place in a dirty laundry bag. He asked me to bring you home, and that's what I plan to do. What you decide to tell Jacob about the last week of your rum spring is your business. Will those men in Placid know how and where to find you if they decide to look? No, she stammered, paling and clenching all over with the memory. They only knew my first name, unless my purse. It was on your bar stool when you vanished from the bar two nights ago. Your friend Hannah grabbed it and gave it to me when I talked to her yesterday. It's on the front seat where you can ride now if you want. So we, you, should be clear. She nodded and looked up into my face from the back of my car and giggled, unexpectedly, to me at least. You're not what I expected. What did you expect, the Marines? No, I had this fantasy that my father and uncles would come in whacking those guys with axe handles or something. I didn't figure on a skinny guy who would cry because of a scratch from a girl. I'm tearing, not crying. <laughs> and for your information, the scratch really hurts. It could get infected. Sadie smiled and moved into the front seat. We headed down the road again, through the thinning woods and into the farmland of far northern New York, towards home. Jacob's dog heard my car long before I got to their house, and they were both waiting by a, by a pole fence when I crunched into the circle in front of the Hostetler home. The Amish dress and lack of pickup trucks in the farm's yard made me feel as though I was driving out of the present day where girls got snatched as playthings for monsters masquerading as boys, and into something that Norman Rockwell, or his father, might have drawn. Jacob nodded at Sadie and waved her up onto the porch where her mother Mary was waiting. He spoke to me only after the women had, had embraced and gone inside with arms around each other. You'll come inside for coffee. It was a statement, not a question, and so even though I would have preferred a Coke or to be home in bed, I climbed the stairs into Jacob's house, nearly tripping on one that was taller than the others. We sat at a heavy kitchen table made from slabs of maple wood that was probably chopped to clear the land for this farm 100 years ago. A younger model of Sadie put steaming cups of black coffee in front of us and closed the door behind us as she left us alone in a hot and pleasantly yeasty kitchen. Before I made the drive up here to meet Jacob two days earlier, I had, as always, done some research. In this case, on the Amish, 
and particularly the Amish of northern New York. Each small community has their own ordnung, or set of rules relating to the dimut, humility, and galassenheit, calmness. Jacob was the leader of the community in Madrid Springs, which included 18 families. His interpretation, understanding, of the rules was law in their valley. Coming to me, an outsider, for help with his daughter had cost him. Might end up costing him the position of leadership he held in his community. I had asked him about it when we met on the second, and he dismissed it with a wave, either assuming that I wouldn't understand because I was an outsider, or that I took it for granted that people took care of family regardless of cost. Tyler Cunningham, I can never thank you in any meaningful way for what you've done for me and my family. While he was verbally sneaking up on what was, for him, an uncomfortable subject, I studied him, his clothes, his kitchen. Most of the room was taken up by a wood cooking stove in this huge table. The faucets at his sink, gas and kerosene lanterns on the wall and overhead, and the lack of outlets along the walls. I was mapping this place and the way it felt and smelled and sounded. I could feel my brain sucking it all in, and the maps that I have inside my head of people and places and ways of being growing, extending. My interest in Jacob's world was the reason I had allowed myself to be roped into this mess in the first place, not the money he was going to awkwardly offer me in a minute or five. My friend Gregory Simmons told me that you helped him a few years ago. It was actually 17 months. And that you would help me, but in my rush and upset the other day, we did not discuss your fee. We can pay any fair price that you name, and we'll count ourselves blessed by God to do it. I'm not a detective, I said. I'm just a guy who does favors for friends with problems or situations that interest me. There was no upside that I could envision in telling him that his daughter didn't interest me nearly so much as the plumbing in their house or the presence of a gas-powered tractor with wooden wheels on a farm with no trucks. Jacob seemed flustered by a response different than what he had anticipated. Is your coffee all right? I hadn't touched the mug in front of me while through some magic of timing or signals, as soon as he had finished his, the younger daughter had come in, refilled it, and left again without being asked or summoned. It smells wonderful, but I don't enjoy hot drinks. Jacob took this in, looked as though the words hadn't come together in a configuration that he was used to, and pressed on. I have paid my way in this world since I was 15, he said. Gregory, bought one of my photographs after the favor that I was able to do him, I suggested. He seemed to understand this quid pro quo and followed up on it. I saw this photograph when I went to see Gregory's help in the matter of Saini, and it's a little showy for my tastes. Last spring, I painted a series of watercolors 20 miles east of here, fields and barns and streams and sky. I used a soft color palette that might go nicely with both your beliefs and with the colors in your house. The last painting I sold in that series went for $500. Jacob seemed vastly relieved to have a number and excused himself for a minute, returning with five $100 bills. He put them in my hand with some ceremony and intoned, for the rest of my life when I look at that painting, I will remember the service that you did me and my Sadie. Still though, I hope that you will call upon me if you ever have need it would be a blessing to help you if it is within my power. I told Jacob that I'd bring the painting around within the week. We talked a few minutes more about Rumspringa and having to explore the world in order to know it, and the possibility of beauty without the sting of evil. We were talking about Sadie, but also about Jacob and about me. We shook hands and I walked out and down and into my car, adjusting my stride on the way to avoid tripping over the single and even step on my way off the porch. I left the Hostetler farm at 8.14 a.m. and headed south, headed home to Saranac Lake, New York. I had expanded my world and maps a little and seen, but not learned, again, the lesson that a simple life in a simple place is not a talisman against bad things or bad people. The next 10 days would teach me this lesson once and for all at great cost and in ways that I couldn't imagine as I navigated my mental map of the world I had built. 
everything would be new and unfamiliar. And for people like me, the unfamiliar, even good if unfamiliar, is worse than an anticipated bad thing. About halfway down to Saranac Lake at 903, I celebrated the 29th anniversary of my birth, as always, in silence and with a hollow awareness of my movement through time and space. So that's from sort of the first chapter of my book. Thank you. <laughs> and my hope in setting forth that early chapter was to set a, set a tone and introduce people to Tyler as someone who would be a different detective and someone who would take a look at the world and the things in it in a different way. And I think that's the gift and challenge that neurodiversity brings. And I think it's an interesting way to approach fiction. And I think our world, especially all, all of our fictional worlds, are more interesting and richer with the diversity in them. So let me see where we got. OK. I'm not great with PowerPoint, so excuse me if I go back or forward too much. <laughs> Neurodiverse characters. So why populate the world, books and TV, with neurodiverse characters? I've already said why I want to, but I'd love to hear from somebody else. If anybody else has an idea of why or some examples of who. Yes, sir. If the idea of populating the world of neurodiverse characters it's to show that they're not like a kind of neurotypical characters who, uh, who while have their own individual ways of thinking, neurodiverse characters often have you know, wilder uh, ways of thinking. And such examples uh, from uh, current television is uh, you know, Dr. Sean Murphy from The Good Doctor and and Sam from Atypical on Netflix. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was I was shocked when I when I saw that Netflix served it up to me a couple months ago, and we binged our way right through that show, <laughs> and I loved it. Um, Do you have something? Yeah, I was trying to say something similar to what you had said, and yeah, it kind of just helps the world understands because I think you got to kind of have awareness about yeah and just think that well this is what a lot I mean maybe that we can relate a lot of us that land by would have I mean probably all of us to some extent of no more diverse here. Mm -hmm. Well that's great yeah I think exactly that's the point and when I was thinking of characters I, I picked off a couple and <laughs> My selections tend to be from mysteries because, again, that's sort of the orb, the way that I think in the orbit that I float in. But um, we, you know, we've we've read and heard Sherlock Holmes in a hundred different incarnations, and Adrian Monk. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yes. It, it comes in and out of streaming capability, so it's tough to watch sometimes. But it's it's a pretty interesting show, and I think Sonia Cross from The Bridge which now has been done, it was originally a book, but it's been done in two, in two or three movies at different borders. The Mexican-US border, and I think there was one with a, Brit, a British-French, and then I also think there was a Norwegian, I don't know who else, whose border with Norway, but it's been done a number of times, and it's a story that obviously keeps asking to be told. And then uh, Christopher Boone, and Temperance Brennan, and Elizabeth Solander from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And these are all interesting characters, and I'm intrigued by all of them, partly because they're, they, they operate on this razor's edge of efficiency and intellect and then these gaps in where they where all of these interesting great characters fall short 
is what makes them so human and so interesting and what pulls me back into the story again and again because they're surrounded by neurotypical characters in their different endeavors, but they are critical components to the worlds that they inhabit because of their neurodiversity. Yes, ma'am. I met an I met an author of this book once anything but typical. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Yeah, that's neat. Um, but I, I think having these characters and others, and there's nowadays more and more, which is wonderful, makes our world more real and the worlds of fiction more interesting and more round feeling. It's, I was sharing with my wife the other day, I, I read a book for my master's program um, talking about round and flat characters. And that flat characters are characters for whom there's almost a program. Billy's mom loves Billy and works hard to keep her son safe and everybody in the house fed. And that's a simple character, which we all know. We all know a Billy's mom or a Billy's dad. But there are characters that are rounded who we get the feeling that they exist outside of the pages or during the commercial breaks. Those are the characters that can surprise us when they do things. And those are characters that grab us most in fiction. And my feeling is that a lot of these neurodiverse characters are more rounded and grab, on, grab and hold our attention in books and TV and film because we can imagine, we can feel them moving through the world outside of the pages of the book. Or during the commercial breaks, you can imagine what they're doing. And that, that extra dimension of being alive makes the experience of reading them a much more real and valid feeling. So, let's write about what you know. I always love this as writing advice, and it's also sort of horrible advice if taken too literally, which is an easy danger to run. Mm -hmm. Write about what you know. If I did that, I would write about making omelets and walking my dogs <laughs> and teaching in a special education classroom. Dogs are great. And, and in my books, I talk a lot, almost probably too much about dogs. Um, if you can talk too much about dogs. But I think really what that advice means and has to do, especially when you're developing characters, and maybe especially neurodiverse characters, is talking about the feelings or conditions or situations or scenarios that you know in the world, that you move through in the world. And so, you know, a plumber doesn't need to write plumbing fiction. <laughs> he can write about the people and the feelings that he experiences in his life. And if he brings those realistically to life, we can read all sorts of things that Fred the plumber writes. He could write a great book about space travel. And very few of us have traveled in space, but we read great stories about that all the time. So I think it's, it's, it can be dangerous to write about what you know and limit it to just the very specific things you know. I tied that a little bit to the concept of the risks and rewards of writing about neurodi neurodiverse characters. I think we talked about some of the rewards is that our world is filled with neurodiverse characters. It makes reading and film and movie and TV more real feeling when we have a neurodiverse cast, or at least people who are neurodiverse mixed in. One of the risks is that 
if it's not within the realm of things you know, it, you can write characters who feel flat, who feel like punching bags, or who, who try to stand out as if this particular character is every autistic person on earth, or this person I'm writing now is every person with ADHD on earth. And that is never a fair thing, fair assumption to make. I was, I was talking with one of your teachers earlier during dinner. Tyler, this character who I've fallen in love with and know quite well over the course of writing these books, is often not a particularly nice person and he acts against what society would think is the right thing to do with some frequency. Sometimes it's by mistake because he doesn't understand what he's doing. Sometimes it's because he feels that he has to act that way to protect his status quo. I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler. At the beginning of this first book, the one that I was reading about, when he gets back to Saranac Lake, he cannot find and get in touch with uh, a research librarian who works at the Saranac Lake Public Library. A lot of what he does day to day involves research at the library. That's how he spends his days, is reading and learning about the world. And he has uh, the help of this research librarian. She disappears and he embarks on, an, on his investigation entirely because he wants her back, because he's used to having her in his life. He's not necessarily doing it because she's his best friend. He, he, at the beginning of the novel, certainly doesn't even think about her in those terms. But he's comfortable with the life that he has in Saranac Lake, and so he wants her back in it. So he starts investigating so that he can find her and bring her back. Because that's what happened last week. She was at the library. She worked with him. He got his work done. That worked for him. So when he does what he does throughout the course of the book, it's because he wants to set his life back in order. He likes the way his life worked before. It's not working that way now. That's upsetting. Same thing happens to me, but I don't make some of the mistakes that Tyler makes. And I think that is partly what makes him interesting. And when I, when I write these stories and get deeper into them, I get to know these characters. And I, I feel like I know Tyler, and I know other characters in the book who are you know, Megan, Frank, and Dot. And in some of the other novels that I had, which I don't have that graphic up on the map, so I can't point. Um, or the novellas that I wrote, I started with the premise of, if I threw these people who I knew, who I know, into this situation, how would they act? And I start typing and try and reason my way through it. And as I said before, the first draft is pretty lousy, and then we work on it to fix it. But these tend to be character-driven books because I know and like the characters, and I throw them into different situations each, each time. Let's see. Ah, here was the picture. So how I wrote more specifically Tyler. As I said before, I didn't want Tyler to represent everybody who's neurodiverse in the world because there's nobody who does that. So it was important to me to think that he's a him, not a them. He's not representing everybody who's like him or even a little like him. He's representing Tyler. And that was important to me to the extent that in the first three books, I think it was in the third, it was the third book before we mentioned a diagnosis or a classification that he'd had. And 
Tyler still doesn't buy into it in the third book. Um, and that's, I think, his business, and that's the way it works for him. Uh, I think a diagnosis can be helpful, especially if it helps. But his feeling is that it, it, it would put him in a box without helping him. So he sort of eschews the, the diagnosis. But his life also doesn't entirely work for him, as we see in these books. So I try to imagine and express the ways that he interacts with the world. Some of the things show, showed through in that first chapter where he's talking about his exactitude in understanding the dimensions of the park or the passage of time. He's learned that most people don't care that it's 9.2, not 10 miles, that it's 118 minutes or 108 minutes, not two hours. So he edits that out because it's useful to him, but not to everybody he deals with. Uh, an interesting thing that I did in thinking about it, he lives homeless, and it was a subject that I liked in writing his character and imagining his character early on, in that, not that he doesn't have a place to sleep at night, most nights he sleeps camping in the Adirondacks, winter and summer, but early on when he lived in the Adirondacks, he had both an apartment and his office, and he found that he spent most of his time in his office because that's where he likes to read. Mm. And so eventually he, he let the lease on his apartment fail and moved a couch into his office. And so when he has to sleep and he's not camping, he sleeps in his office. So he's homeless, but in a way that's functional for him. And I think partly he sort of likes not living up to people's expectations. Um, his critical flaw, as I've mentioned before, is also the saving grace, and it's the balance point on which these books work. He is a brilliant problem solver, but he's also limited in his understanding of the way that some systems, social systems a lot of times, work or don't work. And so in every one of these books, he makes assumptions about the ways people will act and react to him or to other things going on, and they end up dumping him into trouble. Okay. Yeah, he does. Um, one of the things, because I remember talking about the games, a games class or games theory class that was here. One of the things that I've used often, forever really, in writing these books is from a million years ago when I played Dungeons and Dragons, we had character sheets. And I still use a modified form of those today when I'm writing a short story or these longer novels. I make up these character sheets so I know who these characters are. For the same reason I did it when I played D&D a million years ago. It was so that I could get a feeling of realism so that the adventure would be more rounded. That's exactly why I do it now before I write these books. So I get to know who these characters are and can throw them into the stories fully intact. Is there a hand going up? Yes, yes there is. <laughs> What's your favorite book out of the, well, the five books you've read? I think my favorite is probably Here Be Monsters, partly because it's the first one I wrote. Mm. And I'm sort of in love with the whole experience of having written it. But I also like the getting to know Tyler and getting to know his world that's in there. I love the adventures that happen in some of the other books. And honestly, because I want to give fair warning in case somebody was thinking of it, some of these have violence in them and there's bad language. And so, you know, I, I do apologize sometimes. You know, caretakers, there's some nasty stuff that happens to people, but not anything that Tyler does really. He's relatively peaceful, except to the bad guys. They sometimes can come to a sticky end. But um, I find that stuff interesting. But I've almost talked too long, so I want to move on. I have a couple of quotes that I use when writing my stuff. 
And I think they are valuable to bring along when making your characters or thinking about it. This is sort of, Kurt Vonnegut is a wonderful writer and he's been quoted a number of times as saying there's only 12 stories in the world, there's only seven stories in the world. And this is the case where he says, essentially, there's only one story in the world. Somebody gets into trouble, then gets out of it again. People love that story. They never get tired of it. And really, if you have functional, interesting characters and a beautiful setting, which I did in the Adirondacks, and the Adirondacks was really, in lots of ways, a, another character in the books that I write because it's such a beautiful place and Tyler explores it while he's camping, that with interesting characters and a wonderful setting, you can throw in whatever the trouble is and help the characters get out of it, and you've got a great story, hopefully. So, storytelling. I love this by Ray Bradbury. My stories run up and bite me on the leg. I respond by writing everything that goes on during the bite. Then when, when I finish, the idea lets go and runs off. And I've had afternoons like that. I was talking about the NaNoWriMo, where I aim to write 1,500 words a day. And on some days, when the story comes up and bites me on the leg, and the characters are running and rolling, and I have adequate coffee and snacks, <laughs> I've written five or six or 7,000 words. And a lot of that, of course, you go back and fix later. But when the story's rolling, you let it tell itself. Now this one, my wife did not necessarily want me to include it first. <laughs> and I would add with caution that although Ernest Hemingway may have meant it, I do not. <laughs> he said, write drunk, edit sober. I have always taken that to mean write enthusiastically, without stopping yourself, without, without touching the brakes while you're writing. I try not to edit until I'm done with the whole book. And sometimes that gets messy, but I think that mess is okay. So I, that's what I take it to mean when he says write drunk, is throw yourself in with exuberance. Approach the editing, approach it soberly when you're editing and revising but really let yourself get into it. And <coughs> anybody in here a fan of Joss Whedon? Are you familiar with his work? He did Firefly and he did, he's done a lot of interesting movies and TV. And Buffy, of course, yeah. Uh, and what he says about characters, I write to give myself strength. I write to be the characters that I am not. I write to explore all the things that I'm afraid of. And I think almost more than anything else, that's why I'm a writer, is I love exploring the what-ifs of the world in an essentially consequence-free environment. As I mentioned, Tyler does some pretty rough stuff to some of the bad guys in the books. And besides every once in a while getting a, a slightly weird stare from a faculty member I was teaching with, when after they read the book and thought that I might be that guy, I can explore these worlds without any consequences. And I think that's what Joss was talking about. And I can throw myself into characters who I'm not for an afternoon or a week. And that's fun to be able to do that. Uh, on revision, this is one of my favorite things ever from Neil Gaiman. Uh, I am a big fan of sharing my work with people. I love to, and you have to know where the line is. His words, remember, when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right, and it's true. If you read a rough draft of somebody's story, or even a final draft of a story, and there's one part of it, or the dialogue, something that doesn't ring true and falls flat, it pulls you right out of the story, it pulls you right out of the flow. And anybody who reads that story can say, yeah, that part there didn't work for me. The character Sam didn't work for me. The chase scene on canoes, what an idea is that? That's crazy. <laughs> I did that in between the characters. But, um, and so anybody can identify what part doesn't work. The second part is what I love. 
when they tell you exactly what they think is wrong and how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. And I think that's true. Their job as readers is to identify what's wrong with your book or your story or whatever. Your job as the writer is to figure out, okay, how do I fix it? How do I get from eh to wow? And that is the magic that happens in revision. Nobody writes it wonderfully the first time through or sometimes the third or fourth time through. It takes fine tuning and work to get there. But that's the part. Yes, sir, sorry. I hope I haven't been ignoring you for too long. No, no, it's fine. Um, what's the difference between saying something doesn't work for them and saying something is wrong? Nothing. I think it's telling you exactly what's wrong. In this scene, you need to make Jason's dialogue more angry sounding. That could be what they think is wrong with it. What I would ask my reader to say or, or what I'd focus on for my reader is, something in Jason's dialogue didn't work for me. That dialogue is wrong. And that's sort of all you take away from the message. They might also offer, he needs to sound more angry in that dialogue, or he should speak with a lisp, or whatever. You could take that advice or leave it, but really it's your job as the writer to fix the problem that your readers identify. Does that Make sense or answer it a little bit? Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, I think that's it. So, <laughs> look at that. I'm not a PowerPoint slide. Who has a question with anybody? One quick question. Yes. Sir. Have you read the, Bert, um, the Bernie and Chet books? No, no, I have not. Oh my God. When is the dog? <laughs> Oh, one of the detectives is a dog. I will have to track those down. <laughs> Bernie and Chet. Bernie and Chet. Yes, ma'am? Uh, so then there's something here about Amazon and Create Space. Um, oh, yes. Um, I didn't have that down as a talk, but it's something I'm a big fan of. Uh, I published these books through Amazon and Create Space, which is a delightful tool for writers to make their work available worldwide very cheaply and very easily. Within, I was telling people at dinner, within two weeks of hitting the button on publish with my book on Amazon, I got an email from a young woman who was reading the book in Australia, a print copy, which blew my mind to hear from someone on the other side of the world reading a book that I'd written in two weeks. Wow. So yeah. Amazon and CreateSpace I'm a big fan of, and they really make it easy for authors to share their work. And that's one of the things that I like most about being a writer, is the ability to share stories with people. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I'm interested in that you, you've decided to write a book with a neurodiverse protagonist. And your, what, what did you think about in terms of the characteristics um, for Tyler, because I was thinking about you know, here at Landmark, we're we're sort of used to the the gross generalizations that people make about a diagnosis or individuals who are n neurodiverse. And I was struck by I'm not familiar with your book, but I was struck by um, in your reading that the character is in fact insightful, as you said, like thinking about well, most people don't like this, or it seems to be able to take some perspective on someone else's you know, um, sensibility. And I was wondering, you know, if you were thinking, well, as I create this character, I'm either going to challenge stereotypes or I'm going to try to create a certain uh, sense of my read on how someone would act. I'm just wondering about your process. Well, I think when I was sort of getting a feel for Tyler, I wanted him to... struggle in his social interactions with people. And I wanted him to have an uneasy footing in the adult world of Saranac Lake. And he lives there 
but he isn't he isn't fully a part of the community yet. He's a transplant from New York City as I was. But he he hasn't really formed any lasting or very in-depth relationships with the people that he interacts with. And there's a section that I thought about reading, but my voice was hurting, so I didn't, about his concept of mapping. And he does physical mapping, and he did physical mapping when he lived in New York City and also in the Adirondacks. But he also talks about mapping social dynamics and getting to know the people who were most important to his functional living in Saranac Lake. And he refers throughout the books to, he had a pragmatics teacher who he, I don't know if that's the term that's in the use of oh, pragmatics teacher, who he worked with establishing um, some of his routines and some of his awareness checks. And he refers back to her sort of as, as memories of what, what he's doing to self-check himself. And he does a fair amount of self-evaluatory behavior. So I, I guess I didn't want to be, to write Tyler as, like, well, he's not up on the board anymore. <laughs> Christopher Boone, who was up here earlier, is much further along a continuum than Tyler is. And I think I wanted Tyler to challenge neurotypical readers, but was leery of suspension of disbelief for his flavor of detective and his flavor of independent living. So I didn't want to push, at least in the first novel, too hard on I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, sir. Would you say that having like multiple nerd letters can't capture something? I was reading this one series. It's called the Culture Series. It's a sci-fi thing. Mm -hmm. and most of it is about as people like on the fringes of society, like the ones who live on an asteroid and don't know where. Mm -hmm. And so you get everything from just people don't fit the mold to complete oddballs. Like both villains and the good guys are not the typical people characters. So. Yeah. Well, I love those sorts of stories. I just finished a collection by Elmore Leonard of his Western stories. And it's not in space, but it, it's quite similar in that these are pe individuals and loners who live out on the fringes in, in the Old West. And they have to define their own living space, their own way of living, and the ways that they interact with other people in their sort of infrequent orbits with each other. And I think those make for interesting characters. And finding you know, the times when the guy on the asteroid is eight weeks by himself without getting in touch with anybody is probably less interesting and telling about that character than the supply drop that comes once every two months. Because that's when he's tested. And so I think those are the interesting situations for those kind of characters. What was the series called? Oh, this was the complete Western stories of Elmore Leonard. Okay. But he's a great writer. If you haven't read his stuff, he does fantastic dialogue and very simple description. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I I I have aspirations of writing. The neuro and diverse and, and protecting us, but I'm. Uh, how would I uh, go on uh, making sure he's uh, truthful to neurodiverse but still can uh, uh, get to a general or young or younger demographic? Well, I think the the easy answer is that it's not going to be terrifically easy. I think the real answer for you, though, is you should write the story you want to write and then share it with one friend or one person who you know 
and trust. And that will help you figure out, as with that Neil Gaiman quote, what's working and not, what's not working. And then you adjust your story, and the next time around it's a little better. Because no one's going to write it correctly the first time. So the trick is, find someone who can help you. You write your story, the other person will help you get it. In my case, my other person is my wife. She reads my, all of my first drafts. And then I circle out to larger audiences. But it helps to have one person who can see your stuff first and say, this part is great, this part's not working yet. And I think finding that line. Does that help at all? Yes. Okay, good. Was there a right guess? Sir? Tell me how uh, you wrote Tyler Cunningham again. Mm -hmm. um, Did you hear that? Well, yes, I heard. I tried to write, I tried to imagine a character who was, I imagined a combination of a lot of people who I've met. Tyler Cunningham is a little bit me, and a little bit some people who I knew from the school that I worked in, and some people who I grew up with as a kid. And I took a little bit from each of them and tried to make it into a person who would act the way that I imagined him acting. And again, he wasn't right the first time. He took some corrections to make, to make him believable. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. If anybody had any other questions. I'll stay up in the front for a couple of minutes if you didn't want to ask.